Okay. Now the title of the course of lectures is discrete subgroups of D groups. And I will assume a great deal about Lie groups at various stages. I will state exactly what I want, but I cannot go into proofs of those things that will take me too far out. Okay. <clears throat> the first example, uh, I mean I am looking at Lie groups and their discrete subgroups. The first example of course is simplest example is Z sitting inside real line. It is the first example you come across and uh, studying Z is number theory and studying R functions over R and so on is analysis and one has uh, now by now one knows that the analysis on R can give you a lot of information about the arithmetic of Z. Number theory uses a great deal of analysis to do that and the reason it works is that this is sitting inside that. The analysis on that can be used and the first person to use that was Euler. You know Euler's proof of uh, infinitude of primes, that is a very interesting proof. It, it goes like this, I am going to, Euler's proof of infinitude of primes is like this. You look at this, this sum, suppose there are only finitely many primes. This is a finite product, P in primes. But what is this product? This can be expanded as sigma product sigma 1 over p power some lower primes. But this if you expand, you get the harmonic series sigma 1 over n, which diverges. But if there are only finitely many primes, this product is will have to converge. That that is essentially Euler's proof. <clears throat> requires a little more justification, but you can fix it, that is no problem. It is uh, almost as elegant as Euclid's proof, except it uses much more sophisticated notions coming from analysis, the, series, the harmonic series being divergent. Anyway, uh, where is the, yeah. All right. So, and as it turns out, in modern number theory, this uh, looking at discrete subgroups contributes a great deal towards understanding number theory. In fact, uh, so you all have heard of the so called Langlands program and the pro Langlands program tells you that uh, look at this group, n cross n matrices of determinant non-zero. Uh, it is a group, it is a locally compact topological group, it is an open set in Euclidean space, so it is a group. And this contains a certain subgroup which comes from integers, invertible integral matrices. And if you look at GLNR modulo GLNZ, this is a locally compact space. It is not quite a group, GLNR itself is a locally compact group, but this is not a norm normal subgroup. So, quotient does not have group structure, but it is a homogeneous space on which GLNR acts transitively and analysis on this has been, it has been discovered that analysis on this has a great deal to do with Galois theory of number fields. Analysis on the Galois, theory, the Galois group of, uh, look at Galois group of uh, Q bar or Q, it turns out representations of this have a lot to do with this space. The, this space has a certain measure on this. Namely, you take the Haar measure on, on GLNR that is right invariant because if it is right invariant, you, it, this generates a measure. And then you can look at something like L2 GLNR by GLNZ. There is a measure on that. It, it gives you a rep unitary representation of the group GLNR. GLNR operates preserving the measure, and therefore, you get a unitary representation on this. And it turns out that unit representations of this and represent the Galois group are closely related. Representations of Galois, finite dimensional, that is n dimensional representations of this are related to representations of GLNR occurring inside 
L2 from zero to nine percent. So this is the uh, very vaguely and broadly the so-called Langlands program. So represent, representing the Galois group can be related to representations which occur here. Okay, that is the. So it is. Uh, it has become very important in number theory. These considerations of uh, these spaces and the, the measure on them, the unit representations on them, are all very important. Have become very important for number theory. <coughs> And many of those things are uh, still in the conjectural stage. They have not been, it is an ongoing program and maybe it has a very, it's an, it has an army of mathematicians engaged in unraveling what is happening. The man has made broad, Langlands has made broad conjectures, various kinds and a uh, large army of number theorists are working on that. Anyway, so that is why they are interesting, but I will not be talking about representations, it is not uh, my specialization. Well, what I will be interested in will be more like the structure of the subgroups, GL, the, what is the structure of GLNG, what is it like, what can you say about it and so on. And it, it turns out that whatever you can do for the GLN can do it in a little more general context and what is general context? Goes like First I have to define the notion yeah, of an algebraic group, a linear, a linear algebraic group. defined over a number field. Actually number field is not important, I think I mean for this definition what you want is a, a subfield of complex numbers. Take any subfield of complex numbers and then I have a notion of a linear algebraic group defined over such a subfield. But mostly I will be interested in the number field, so there is no loss of general, I mean I will be, most of the things I say will work for in general even though I may say it only for number fields. Okay, what is the definition? A linear algebra group, it is a subgroup of G, L and C, algebraic groups are always the complex D groups. So, it is going to be a subgroup of GL and C, <coughs> which is uh, which is also the set of zeros of a collection of functions of the form. The matrix A i j going to a polynomial in the A i j's. I'm sorry, yeah, A i j is a polynomial in the A i j's and determinant of A i j. So, P of A i j and also add determinant. So, A i j where P is a polynomial right, with polynomial with coefficients a collection of polynomials of the kind. So, let me also put P, P alpha, alpha is some parameter some <coughs> P alpha A i j determinant A i j determinant with coefficients in k. Determinant inverse or oh, sorry, a determinant inverse. You are right. See, in GLN, determinant is a nice function. Oh. <laughs> so, I add the determinant inverse. Determinant inverse makes sense on GLN. So, I add determinant inverse and take any collection of polynomials. In fact, one so P alpha, alpha is in some set. One can assume without loss of generators, alpha is finite. That is because if these functions vanish, the ideal generated by them vanishes, but any ideal in the ring generated by A ages along with the determinant inverted is finitely generated, it being a Noetherian ring. The polynomial ring is a Noetherian ring and the, if I invert one, one element it makes no difference, it will continue to be Noetherian and therefore, <coughs> this is a Noetherian ring. So, it is actually you can without loss of generator you can say yes finite. 
So that's the definition of an algebraic group. JLNC itself is an algebraic group. You can take the polynomial 0, single polynomial. Oh, okay, so that's a definition. Let me right away give you examples of algebraic group. It's a subgroup of JLNC, is how I defined it. <coughs> so that, now let me right away give you examples. <coughs> Take for instance, uh, the first example is GLNC itself is an algebraic group because you, you can take the ideal to be the 0 ideal. If, <coughs> so, second example, take for example the uh, matrix of the form 1, Z, 0, 1, Z in this is obviously isomorphic to C itself and similarly this is the set of matrices with off diagonal entry 0 and determinant equal to 1. So obviously therefore there is the polynomial conditions which I choose an algebra group. Take SL and C. So just the set of uh, matrices where determinant is one. So the polynomial you're looking at determinant minus one. That is it. These are little more. Uh, uh, notice that all these examples are defined for Q. Yeah, these are simply vanishing with the lower matrix entry and these two matrix entries minus 1 equals 0 which are polynomials with coefficients in Q. That is so the, similarly here the off, off diagonal entry is vanishing and the product of the diagonal entry is equal to 1 again polynomial which are coefficients determinant of the polynomial all of its coefficients are in Q. So these are such examples. <coughs> okay, Let us get a little let us look at this example. S O and C. The set of elements T in G L and C. Let me write O and C first. G L and C with the property that transpose T T equal to one. This is the same thing as the group subgroup of G L and C which leaves the quadratic form z1, z2, zn going to sigma zi square leaving this quadratic form invariant. You can easily see the two, this condition is same as transpose t, t equal to 1. Again, this what is involved are number of polynomials with coefficients in Q. And in this of course you can put in subgroup S, Y and C which means an additional condition of determinant 1. Similarly, the symplectic group. It can be described as the group which leaves invariant non degenerate alternating form on. <coughs> Notice that uh, O and C can also be see, I this it leaves invariant this quadratic form, but over complex numbers, any two quadratic forms which are non degenerate are equivalent. That is, by change of basis, you can get one quadratic form from another if they are non degenerate. And in particular, this, this is a non degenerate form, what I have written down. So everything is equal to every not degenerate form is equal to that, and therefore the orthogonal group can you can put any any quadratic form you you will get a group isomorphic to this. But one has to be a little careful. I have, to, I have been talking about groups defined over a number field. The, if you take two quadratic forms, they may be equal. They they may be equal. I mean isomorphic over complex numbers, but they may not be isomorphic over the ground field. Like for instance. If you look at the quadratic form of two variables, 
you can look at x1 square plus x2 square, two variables. You can also look at x1, x2. That's also a quadratic form. This is also a quadratic form. The two are not equivalent over real numbers, for example. The, or, or, therefore, over q, they are not equivalent because over q, you can find, you can take the a vector like this, one zero. Then this on on this vector, the quadratic form vanishes. X one, x two will be zero, but this quadratic form will not vanish on any non-zero vector. So the two are not equivalent to over q. So more generally, one, one, so if f is a quadratic non-degenerate quadratic form, <coughs> or number field k, then S O F is an algebraic subgroup defined over k. So the for the symplectic group, we can't do anything uh, similar because any two symplectic forms over any field are equivalent. Any non-degenerate symplectic form is equivalent to any other non-degenerate symplectic form over any field, whatever. So <coughs> these are the standard examples, and these, in fact, are called classical groups. S L N. Yn, Syn, and so on. They are called classical groups. Now, I, one so one has a notion of uh, algebraic groups defined over k. One also has the notion of morphisms defined over k. Firstly, if you have suppose G H, yeah, let me write. G algebraic group defined over K, then it notice that if, you, you know, if an algebraic group is defined over a certain field, it is also defined over any bigger field because polynomials have coefficients that field. Any bigger field always contained in C. I am assuming all fields contained in C. So G is defined over K, therefore, it, in particular, it is also defined over complex numbers. And I will denote by CG. What I will call regular functions on G. <coughs> These are restrictions of polynomials. At this point, I'm putting C there, polynomials with coefficients is C. In the entries A, J, and determinant inverse. That is, I look, I look, at, I look at these functions, determinant inverse, as well as the various polynomials in the A, J, and restrict them to G. I call them the regular functions. In G and C, G and C is after all an open set name in C, and the Matrix entries are all nice functions and polynomials in those are regular functions, but you also add the inverse of the determinant because determinant is nowhere zero. So this I'll call regular functions and denote them by C G. Inside here, once the algebraic group is defined over K, inside here is some called K G. What's happened? What is you have C of G L and C by definition is all polynomials in the matrix entries and determinant. Notice that you can form K, you can adjoin to K the matrix entries and determinant inverse. That is a subalgebra of this, it is a subalgebra over K. It is sitting inside this, it consists of functions which are with coefficients in k. So, if you take the matrix entries and polynomials in them with coefficients in k, they are all going to be, they, they are all going to be a subset of this and you the restrictions of this will be called k will be denoted kg. 
So you can restrict restrictions of this to G is by definition KG. One calls uh, CG also the coordinate ring of G and this is the coordinate ring of G over K. Maybe I'm. Uh, I don't know if I. You, I can probably assume something more about uh, knowledge of algebraic varieties and so on. So I'm making it uh, maybe a little too elementary. I don't know. Anyway, it it stop being elementary soon enough. So you don't. Have to. <laughs> so when I, when I talk of an algebraic group over a certain field, I can talk of coordinate func coordinate ring over that field or regular functions over that field will make perfect sense. And then a morphism between two algebraic groups f g to h is simply a, <coughs> it's a continuous map. I am going to use the topology, standard topology on GLNC in complex message try. Is, uh, continuous map such that phi composed with f is regular for every phi which way is it uh, for every phi the in regular on h and it is it is defined over k If this map takes it takes kh into kg. So take a k regular function on h, compose with this f, you get a k you want to get a k regular function on g. It is a morphism defined over k or a k morphism if you like. These are basic notions we need repeatedly. Okay, now and once you have a notion of morphism, a notion of isomorphism. So mapping in both directions such that the composite is identity, everything defined over k, etc. Now, this point I will define an arithmetic subgroup of an algebraic group defined over k. This is the notion I am going to define next. Firstly, k is a number field. In the number field, you have the notion of integers in the number field. If you are uncomfortable with that, just think of k as q and o k as z. Okay. It is very often that is, I mean, that, that case is illustrated to everything else. It is not the general case is not much more difficult to handle once you understand what happens in the case k equal to q. Okay, now we have this. Now let us look at G, an algebraic group defined over K. That is why I will write defined over K, I will write like this G algebraic group or simply G over K. Then G is by definition G is something which is sitting inside 
j l and c. So, subgroup of that and in j l and c it makes sense to talk of j l and o. All matrices of non-zero determinant but they, with entries in O, okay, non, uh, with the in invertible matrices in JLN. It makes sense of that and I can form this G intersection JLN which I will call G O. An arithmetic subgroup, K is a number field of course, K an arithmetic subgroup of G over K, G defined over K is a subgroup gamma contained in G K such that gamma intersection G O has finite index in gamma as well as g o. In general one says two subgroups of a bigger group are commensurable if the intersection of the two has finite index on both. So, this can be rephrased as saying gamma and g o are commensurable. Why am I making this definition? It's just <coughs> I mean I, I <coughs> Imitating the way Z sits in R, I could have simply taken G O itself, but that is not satisfactory for the following reason. The thing is, suppose you have suppose you have a group G over K and it is isomorphic to H over K. This of course is sitting inside some G L M and this will be sitting inside G L M. When I say an isomorphism, it's it's going to for this Gij will go into a matrix here will go into a polynomial in the Gij plus and determinant Gij. That's where it goes. So this is coefficients in k, coefficients in k. So even if I start with an integral matrix, you may end up in a non-integral matrix. So Go will not necessarily go into Go, but what I, it will not go into Ho in general. But it turns out it will go into something which is commensurable H O with H O which is the reason for making this definition like this. And then the notion of an arithmetic group is independent of G sitting in up to isomorphism, the isomorphic groups are the same arithmetic subgroups, call it a, yeah. So, why is this? To see this the point is this take in, inside notice first in G L and Z we have lots of subgroups of finite index. More generally in GL and O, we have lots of subgroups of finite index for any O. Why? You can take suppose A is non-zero ideal in O. Then O by A is finite. This is a property of all number fields. Any ideal in the ring of integers has finite finite index, a subgroup of finite as a subgroup, it is a subgroup of finite index. It is obvious in the case of Q, Z, every ideal is a principal ideal, the quotient is a finite, non zero ideal, quotient is finite. Same thing is true in number fields as well. It is a finite index, okay. <coughs> now, Look at the natural map from G L N O to G L N O by A. Take an invertible matrix, just reduce all the entries modulo A, you get a matrix here and if it is invertible that is also going to be invertible. This is finite. So, the kernel is finite which I will call G L N A is a finite index, not the kernel is not finite, it is a finite index. You have a natural map into a finite group and the kernel consists of all matrices whose entries 
are congruent to a i j is congruent to delta i j modulo the idea. The set of elements g in g l and o with the property that g i j minus delta i j is in the i j. Now, if I look at this g i j, suppose g i j belongs to g l and o, g l and of some, look at the mapping g i j to p g i j. So, this is going to be a, this can be thought of as a, either as a polynomial g i j and the determinant or g i j, I can look at minus delta i j, okay. <coughs> it, you can think of it as a polynomial determinant of this uh, determinant inverse of course, which is uh, yeah, determinant inverse minus If it is a polynomial in this, it is equally a polynomial in this. After all, it is changing the variable by some scalar change. And now, if I now, if the p, they are polynomials with coefficients with some uh, elements in k, which means you can always write them as a fraction, something in O divided by something in O, but the denominators, there are only finitely many terms here, the denominators will be bounded by something or there will be a greatest common divisor. And if the original g i j is such that j i j minus delta i j is an ideal which is generated by the g c d, then all these elements will be <coughs> become integral. So, the denominator will get cleared when, when you do. So, you substitute the g i j minus delta i j, the denominators will get cleared and you will become integral. So, some for a suitable ideal a, j l and a will go into integral matrices. For suitable A, G L N A maps to. Sorry, I'm not, I'm not saying it right. I'm looking at. Uh, so, no, no. What I should say is the following. Yeah, th this is the mapping which takes G to H. So, G O, G of A. Yeah, by definition, G A will be G L N A intersection G. Then what happens is G A maps to maps into G O for a suitable H O A not equal to 0 in O. Because of the fact that you can the denominators are all bounded they can they can be cleared once it goes sufficiently deep in the idea. <coughs> so, that shows that a subgroup of finite index maps into a subgroup of finite index, that a subgroup of finite index maps into J L and O and you can reverse the argument and both ways it works and therefore, the notion of arithmetic group is depends only on the isomorphism class of G, K isomorphism class of G and not the particular realization of G as a subgroup of G L N. So, the notion of arithmetic group depends only on the k s morphism class. <coughs> arithmetic subgroup. So, this course of lectures I more to talk about various properties of arithmetic groups, okay. something about the structure, what can you say about them as group theoretically and something about <coughs> cohomology of arithmetic groups, we will see. And finally, I, there is a theorem which tells you that practically every discrete subgroup with one additional property which, which, which is said, which, which says uh, what, what is called a lattice. If it if it happens to be a lattice, then 
practically every arithmetic group is every discrete subgroup with some additional property is necessarily an arithmetic group for a suitable number of fields etc 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 for a, for a suitable group if you are starting with a group and then to determine an algebraic group over a number of field etc it will be arithmetic in this sense <coughs> that's the theorem of margulis anyway that is the it will come at the end of these lectures towards the end. But before that, we will prove various things about arithmetic groups. As I said, this uh, homogeneous spaces G mod gamma have become very important in number theory. Of course, uh, the, the uh, geometry also has uh, lots of, uh, I mean, uh, lots of discrete groups arose from geometry as well. For example, if you take a compact Riemann surface, the universal covering of the compact Riemann surface is often the unit disk. It's a, the uniformization theorem tells you that any simply connected Riemann surface is either the unit disk or the plane or the sphere. Now, if you take a compact Riemann surface whose fundamental group is infinite, then it has there only the universal covering is necessarily either the plane or the unit disk. The plane occurs when the Riemann surface happens to be a torus, that is S1 cross S1. That's the only situation. If it's if the the to topologically it must be S1 cross S1, then the universal covering is necessarily the plane. But if it's not S1 cross S1, then the so called when the genus is greater than equal to 2, the universal covering is the disk. And then the remind what is the remind surface itself, which is the disk factored out by a discrete subgroup of the automorphism group of the unit disk, which happens to be PSL2R, that is SL2R modulo plus minus 1. SL2R is the Lie group, and this occurs as a discrete group. And so, from, from the point of view of geometry, also the, the such discrete groups have considerable interest. But the because of the fact that ultimately it turns out that most the discrete groups are arithmetic, one concentrates on arithmetic groups. The, in fact, the only case where you essentially the only cases where you get non arithmetic groups is the case of the Riemann surface and the thing I am talking about. But anyway, um, okay, now the, I will. Now, yeah, in the study of arithmetic group, the, of course, an important role is played by the group J and Z, which of course uh, contains S L and Z as a subgroup of finite, a subgroup of index two. Clearly, because determinant, if any invertible matrix has determinant invertible in Z, which means the only invertible elements in Z are plus minus 1, so the determinant has to be plus minus 1. And SL and Z itself is contained in a smaller group SL and Z. Of course, it is contained therefore in between SL and R figures. This is not an algebraic group because it is not a complex Lie group, but it is a Lie group. Turns out, if you look at the quotient space S L and R, S L and Z, this carries a natural measure, namely you start the, the right invariant measure S L and R, it is invariant on S L and Z in particular because it is invariant in all translations and therefore you get a the quotient inherits a measure. If you take an open, see what happens is this, if you, here is the space here and the quotient space is here and if you take a sufficiently small open set here, in, in the inverse image will break, it is a covering, so the inverse image will break up into the disjoint union and you declare the measure of this to be equal to the measure of any one of these inverse image open sets that give you a measure, a Borel measure on S L N R by S L N C. The Haar measure, the right invariant Haar measure. on SLNR gives a natural measure on SLNR SLNZ. Yeah, 
it turns out this measure is actually you know, on SLNR based energy you have a left traction based SLNR. Left translation in SLNR translates to I mean gives you a left traction on of SLNR based LNG and the hard measure in this case is actually bi invariant it is both right and left invariant. Reason SLNR is its own competitor subgroup because it is own competitor subgroup this right invariant hard measure is also left invariant which implies the measure on SLNR by SLNZ is invariant under the action of left action of SLNR. The remarkable fact is that this happens to be a finite measure that the total measure of SLNR by SLNZ if you fix a R measure on SLNR gives you a invariant measure is you see and the theorem which is due to Minkowski is that the R measure I will call the measure on SLNZ also the R measure on SLNR by SLNZ is finite. So, in particular you can choose the measure such that the total measure of the space is 1. You choose R, R measure is well defined only up to your scalar you can choose that scalar so the measure becomes equal to 1. Now, this theorem is uh, proved by exhibiting a certain nice subset of SLNR which maps almost 1 to 1 to the image this subset having a finite measure okay. In fact, there is what, what we do is to exhibit a subset of finite measure inside SLNR which maps bijectively not, not such bijectively but finite to 1 from on to this quotient space. And then since even a bigger set is a finite measure the original thing has to have. So, that is the sign, but what is that kind of uh, region which does the job that is what we are going to describe now. In fact, that is what Minkowski proved and it is a the statement there is actually a corollary a sharper statement which I am going to make. For this I need some more definitions and Firstly, SLNR. Oh, by the way, when I have an algebraic group defined over K, if K happens to be contained in R, then I can talk of real points because if any group defined over K, it will also be the group defined over R, and then it is going to be contained in GLNR. So, I can intersect with GLNR. So, any, any, any L between C and K, K you can define C, K, uh, L points if you like. This is a GK. Somewhere I should have written this. GK is also called K points of G. K points of G is in independent of the way G is embedded in GLN. I am how do I get it? I intersect G with GLN K, but suppose G is isomorphic to H under K isomorphism, then GK will go isomorphically on THK because there are mappings in both directions. Anyway, so SNR has certain, certain nice subgroups. Subgroup, there is the SON, which is a set of matrices transpose T T equal to 1. What I should call, if, if I think of the, the way I define the quadratic uh, orthogonal group, uh, it is the real points of the orthogonal group. You know, I, I define an orthogonal group over Q, it is the real points of the orthogonal group. <coughs> SON is group and I defined by A to be diagonal matrices and Yang will be upper triangular unipotent matrices, upper triangular matrices. This I will also write this as minus k. 
upper triangular matrices with one on the diagonal. One has one for every diagonal entry. This K notice is a compact group. If you expand transpose T T equal to one, you find sigma A J square with six I square is one. <coughs> which tells you it is a set of bounded set of matrices inside inside M and R, which is R n square, is bounded and is closed. Bounded closed subset of M and R are compact. So it is a compact group. A is a compact group. A is abelian. Diagonal matrices all commute with each other. N is actually nil potent. Matrix like this is what you are looking at 1, 1, 1 here, 0 here, something here. It is easy to check that this group is nil potent. When you take a bracket of n with itself, you will find the all the entries in the super diagonal first super diagonal row will disappear. Take one more, one more row will disappear, and so on. So, keep on the descending central series therefore ultimately end up in 1 and you take commutators. So, n is nil potent. In the case of SL2, you get this group which is obviously isomorphic to C. So, when you do this you find the first quotient will be C n minus 1, this is a n, n by n matrices. So, first quotient, quotient will be C n minus 1. The next portion will be C n minus 2 and so on finally, in the for the descending central series. Now, I want to introduce some subsets of these spaces. So, for in A, if T, yeah, sorry, A diagonal matrices with uh, all positive entries, that is A. Then there is a Theorem which is known as Ribasawa decomposition says the following look at the mapping K cross A cross N into G given by K comma A comma N going to K times A times N. This or G is SLNR. This mapping is a K, A, N are all D groups. K, the orthogonal group is a D group, okay. and so are A and N. They are all D groups, and therefore they are analytic manifolds. And you have this mapping K cross A cross N into SLNR. It's an analytic map. K is a D subgroup. A is a D subgroup. So the each inclusion is an analytic map. So the product and the product. In the, the group is analytic because it is a Lie group. So, the, this mapping is an analytic map, and what it tells you is this is an analytic isomorphism of manifolds, not, not groups, but simply of analytic manifolds. It is an isomorphism of analytic manifolds. So, this is as the name indicates the theorem due to the Japanese mathematician Iwasawa. I mean he put a much more general theorem this uh, must is probably was known long before Iwasawa proved his theorem. His theorem is for any league, any single group practically any connected league group he has a theorem which is there is a decomposition like this where K will be a compact group, A will be an abelian group and N will be nil potent group. You have such a decomposition. And here notice also that A normalizes N. And therefore, A times N is a solvable group, which is not nilpotent. 
Okay, now I introduce some more subsets of this group. Uh, for t greater than zero, I do not buy a t the set of <coughs> matrices, diagonal matrices. Diagonal, uh, yeah, with di by di plus one less than equal to t. All the diagonal entries is positive, and I impose this condition. Take so here, see, the entry looks like d one d two, d n. I want the ratio d one by d two to less than t, d two by d three less than t, etc. That set I do not buy a t, and the second set I want is for, for a con constant c greater than zero, n sub c will be equal to the set of matrices n in n with the condition that n i j in modulus less than to half for i less than j. for i equal to j the matrices are all one anyway. Oh, sorry, sorry. Sorry. I am. Sorry. No, no, no. It's not. It's not Jordan decomposition. No. You see the Yan. How do you get Yan? Well, this this Yan did comes from a flag. Namely, take the vector. Take a basis. Take take the flag generated by first t one, first vector e one, second e one, e two, e two, e two, e three, and so on. So the triangle, triangle, the triangular matrices are those which fix that flag. Okay. So if you start with any matrix, you uh, you can uh, you. Okay. Uh, well, I, 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 uh, orthonormalization. Right, right. The, no, the, the, that is you can uh, carry any flag to any other flag by means of uh, orthogonal transformation. That that is what is involved here. Okay. Anyway, so the first statement fact which uh, you like can be called a theorem is that the Haar measure of k times a t times n c that means I am looking at the image here of the set k times a t times n c is finite. This set is finite measure. The th way to handle it is to look at what happens. Take you have this su subset here. Take the hard measure here. This is an isomorphism. Take the measure over here. Pull back the measure to this. You get a measure on this. You express that measure in terms of the hard measure of k times hard measure of a times hard measure of n. Then it turns out in terms of that you can express it because it, the pullback measure is absolutely continuous with respect to this product measure. And then you have to find out what the red on equilibrium derivative is. That happens to be you can see it, it the new measure will be the hard measure of this times hard measure of this times hard measure of this plus a function purely in this, in this variable a. And then the hard measure here is going to be finite and because I am looking at a compact thing and the nc is again measure is finite because nc is a compact subset of n. The only thing that gives you trouble here it turns out it will be like this is a product of r cross. So the hard measure will look like dt1 by t1, dt2 by t2 etc. dtn by tn and then you are going to multiply by something which is of the form e power minus a1 t1 times e power minus a2 t2 etc. That is the kind of thing that you will get as the red on equilibrium derivative. 
and therefore when you integrate from 1 to c uh, minus infinity to c the measure will be finite that is the way it works. I do not want to go into details. You I do not remember I think you will find a proof in my book on discrete subgroup of B groups. Okay. So, the next result one wants to prove is the following again this, this is again Minkowski it says that if P is greater than or equal to 2 by root 3 and C is greater than or equal to half then K A P <coughs> and C times S L and Z is all of S L and R. So, this set will map subjectively onto S L and R modulo S L and Z. When I saturate by S L and Z, I get the whole of S L and R. So, this set will map subjectively onto S L and R by S L and Z and this I have just now said as finite measure. So, it will prove that the quotient here has finite measure. Corollary is the earlier stated theorem of Minkowski says that S L N R by S L N Z has finite so such as if you have a locally compact group and a discrete subgroup such that the quotient has finite Haar measure then you call it a lattice. So, that is a definition the lattice in a locally compact group G is a discrete subgroup gamma in G such that such that the Haar measure on right hand variant Haar measure on G descends to a finite measure on G mod gamma. It is an easy exercise. If this happens, G is automatically unimodular. That is, the right invariant Haar measure is automatically left invariant as well. If G admits a lattice, G, the Haar measure, right invariant Haar measure, is also left invariant. I think. So, I will skip the proof of this fact, okay. It is uh, as I said really an exercise ultimately and also it is uh, I mean if you work at it, it will give you some familiarity about handling differential forms and stuff like that. So, this okay. So, this is the theorem I will prove. <coughs> but before I prove the theorem, I will talk about one consequence of the theorem, which is important. It is called 
mother's criterion. Says the following: Suppose a sequence G n in S L n R goes to infinity mod S L n Z if and only if there exists lattice points alpha n g n minus 0 which is of course contained in R n such that g n alpha n goes to 0, non-zero lattice points which are dragged to 0 by the sequence g n. g n is a sequence in S and R, I am looking to see when in the quotient it <coughs> goes to infinity. In particular, first of all, the quotient S L N R by S L N Z is not compact. It is non-compact. That's why it makes sense to talk of something going to infinity there. And actually, that fact also is built into it because you can look at the following sequence of matrices. Look at T N, T N inverse one, and look at what it does to the vector E one. It gets multiplied T n square E one. If T n goes to zero, T n can go to infinity as well as zero. If T n goes to zero, this goes to zero, which will tell you that this criterion will tell you that uh, then T n has to go to infinity modulo gamma. So and in fact, so if once this criterion is done, you also know immediately that the quotient is not compact. Okay. And this question is quite easy to prove once you have this statement. The idea is this you first <coughs> solve the sequence G n and look at you there exists gamma n in I, I mean let me call this group S L and Z gamma. There exists gamma n and gamma such that G n gamma n falls into <coughs> This k a t k a two by root three and half. There is a gamma n which does this. And the point is that if I that g n goes to infinity mod gamma implies that g n gamma n also goes to infinity mod gamma. Right. Now, <coughs> so if g n goes to infinity mod gamma, so does g n gamma n. But this is, you know, this is the form some k n, a n, theta n, the theta n stays in a compact set and a n is a diagonal matrix and k n is something in compact. So g n goes to infinity, so does g n gamma n, it is enough to prove that a n theta n drags something to infinity because k n is compact, so something so drags uh, lattice points to 0. In fact, I claim that a n theta n E1 goes to 0 in this case because theta n fixes E1. And then what does a n E1 do? It takes a n E1 will be the first entry diagonal entry a n 1 1 E1. And then if you look at <coughs> a n, yeah, the point is if you look at the diagonal entries, they look like a n 1, 1, a n 2, 2 and so on. And we have this inequality a n 1, 1 less than or equal to 2 by root 3 a n n 2, sorry a n 2, 2 and so on. The product is 1 and if this goes to infinity, this has to necessarily go to 0. The product is always 1 and this is kind of, it is not quite the least, but you know, it is the 
up to a factor of 2 by root 3 power r, it is the smallest possible. The smallest possible one will have to go to 0. Okay. Because Sorry? Here? No, S L N, G N and that is S L N or Oh sorry, that should, uh, should I should really I'm sorry. Yeah. No, no, no. Let's uh, I don't know, <laughs> make it M. But then I am stuck here. Because some it is a finite term. One moment. N is fixed, M is the one which goes to the sequence. So G M, sorry. So here is a product of a number of uh, element, number of real numbers, positive, positive reals. The product is one, and this one is not quite the least, but you know it's going to be bounded by two by root three a one one etc. Which one? Yeah, the finite. The, the, yeah, yeah, there are only n elements there. Yes. The product is one, okay. and therefore the least of them will have to go to zero. It, it, the whole thing is within, see, okay. Let us take two, two case of two elements, for instance, a n 1, a m 1 1 and a m 2 2, the product is 1 and when I apply to e 1, so this is 1 and if a m 1 e 1, <coughs> if a m 1 goes to infinity, a m 2 2 also goes to infinity. Okay, and so the product is one. If if one of them, if both are bounded, see, I'm my <coughs> if it goes, see, in 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 this, if it doesn't go to infinity, it will stay comp, it will stay in a compact set even in the quotient. So it has to go to infinity in this. And in this, there are only when I take two very uh, SL two for instance, there are only two directions. In one of them, it has to go to zero. In the other one, it has to go to infinity. That's the way it can happen, because the product is one all the time. And same argument to many factors, a one, the product is 1 and this is the others are all two by, less than or equal to 2 by root 3 etc. That is the kind of a, you know each is less than or 2 by root 3 of the next use, use that fact and then <coughs> okay. So that proves if gm, GM goes to infinity mod gamma then so does gm. The other way is even easier. If, if you have a sequence gn Suppose g n is, is not uh, does not go to infinity modulo gamma. That means what? There exists a theta n or g, g m theta m, which goes to a limit. But then look at g m theta m. <coughs> right, g m alpha n alpha m as g m theta m applied to theta m inverse. This is a lattice point and this is a compact, this lies in a compact set. So it can, you know, can, it cannot contract it beyond a certain point. The inverse is also, comp the inverse also lies in a compact set. So from that it follows. So this uh, thoroughly tells you that gives you a criterion for when the sequence goes to infinity modulo gamma. And as we will see, the, the use, this will be used in a very nice way to prove for certain subgroups of G, if you intersect with S L and Z, you will get a discrete group with compact quotient. It is to prove such a thing that you would use this criterion. It is called Muller's criterion. Anyway, let me get back to Minkowski's case theorem. This proved by an induction. Induction on M. Sorry, you embed what? SLG. Then what? If something is true for SL2, why? Is, how does it? No, the, I want to prove this statement, the Minkowski theorem, which tells you that if t, be, t is greater to 2 by root 3 and c is greater to half, this is equal to SL and R. Obviously, if it, I mean, there is an inductive procedure by which you can reduce to SL, SL2, but you can't. Uh, the, the, if it is true for SL2, it does not immediately follow. You have to work, work a little bit. The way it works is the following. So, 
proof of Minkowski's theorem. What you do is this, you take uh, <coughs> element G, and then if you look at G on the lattice vectors Zn minus 0, this is again a lattice and there, are, there is a vector of minimal length in that lattice. Okay. So, there exists a primitive element alpha such that alpha in Zn minus 0 such that G alpha in norm is less than G beta for every beta in Zn minus 0. Okay. Discrete lattice, so if you take the norms of various vectors, it has to be one of, there is a minimal one. You can actually, therefore, to prove our theorem, you can replace G by G alpha. After all, I am saying after translating by gamma, I can get into that this side, this kind of set is called a Ziegel set. You can, I can get into a Ziegel set after translating by some element is what I am saying. So, can replace G by G alpha, which you can. And again, write this G alpha as K times Sorry, uh, I'm sorry. I'm, I, sorry, I skipped some step. Now, I said alpha is a primitive element, which means it's uh, if you write it, write out the coordinates, there is no com common factor, which means there exists gamma such that gamma alpha, gamma e one is alpha. Now look at g gamma. I can replace G by G gamma because my set is, I am translating by gamma anyway. So, G can be replaced with G gamma. G gamma takes its minimum on E1. So, G gamma E1 in norm is less than or equal to <coughs> G gamma V beta for every beta Zn. In other words, I can assume G, the minimum of G on the lattice is actually taken at the, at the first vector E1. So, can assume G E1 in norm is less than or equal to G F no, G beta for every beta in Z n minus 0. So, <coughs> this minimal vector is vector with the minimal norm after trans after applying G, I can assume to be equal to the first vector E1. Now, write this element. So, I have assumed this statement G1 is G beta. Write now the element G as k times a times n. The was our decomposition that you want to use. Now, actually, I can uh, forget k because our my re, my uh, Ziegel domain k eight etc is left translation invariant under k, so can replace k by I mean g by a n. A n is upper triangular. So a, this g I can therefore write as. So, G prime, G1, G1, something like that. It can be written like this. Norm is also K invariant. Huh? This, this norm is also K invariant. Norm what? This norm here. Norm? Huh. What about the norm? It's, you are assuming that it's K. Uh, it's no, K. It, no, norm is not changed because K preserves the norm. Huh, so, you are taking such a norm. I, I, when, I, when, when I said norm, implicitly it is standard norm in Euclidean space, which is invariant under the orthogonal group. Sorry, yeah. yeah. When I say, yeah, the norm is the norm, the standard norm in Euclidean space is sum of squares, 
and that is of course same, same in the orthogonal group s y. Now by this g prime, <coughs> well, uh, okay, yeah, this g prime can be written as. Zero star yeah. what I want to say is the following g prime can I can assume actually g prime to be of the form uh, yeah, no, I, I want to re see a little thing I have to say here g prime is some scalar times g double prime where G double prime in is in S L n minus one. This determinant may not be one. You have to compensate for determinant G one inverse, but it's a form lambda G double prime etc. And by induction hypothesis for G double prime, we can find a gamma in S L n minus one G. Actually, I should have stated the result with uh, not with SLN but GLN itself then the induction would have been smoother but here I have to fuss a little bit because of that. So what happens is this, so lambda plug in a gamma prime look at this G1 star G prime this is 0 here and then plug in here 1 0. 0 gamma uh, uh, sorry uh, ga gamma prime or let me call it gamma 1 gamma 1 this is going to the form this is going to be the form g star 0 g prime gamma 1 and by induction hypothesis I can assume that this is in S O n minus 1 times a in the a prime I call it that is in the S L n minus 1 <coughs> a prime uh, th th this falls into I should say I had that uh, lambda it is lambda times g double prime g double prime falls into S O n minus 1 times a prime times n prime half. My induction hypothesis is this true. Okay, now once that is done, so if I put in the diagonal entries, the diagonal entries for G of the G prime gamma 1 are lambda times some, something lambda times something, etc., and the ratio less than 2 by root 3 will still be preserved. And I, I push the n already there. Okay. Now the situation is this. So once I do this, now we know that our this this uh, notice that when I transform by gamma one, e1 is left undisturbed. So e1 is still the minimum e1 for this element. G this element new elements have got apply it on e1 its norm is a minimum of uh, all possible norms of lattice vectors coming from this element that is so let us call this uh, this product let me call it h we have h e1 norm is less than or equal to h beta for every beta in <coughs> zn minus 0 this is still holds. Again, expand this out as k times a times something. So this g, uh, g is already diagonal anyway. So you have g one some k double prime, which you have pulled out here, 
and then some diagonal matrices G22 or I call it H, right? So let me write H22, etc. Times something in the upper triangular, and here all the entries are of modulus less than or equal to half. Here we do not know, and this is G1 here. Sorry, this is 1 here. Should write 1, 1, 1, 1, and here are entries nij with mod nij less than equal to half and some entries here. That's the situation. Now, you just look at the span of E1 and E2. What we didn't know is G gamma of uh, E1. See, we even need to span a span of this is a Z2, which contain R2. Now take gamma in SL2Z and complete it, take a gamma in SL2Z and complete it as with ones below. And then you have the condition that G gamma E1 is less than or equal to, sorry, uh, G1, which is the first entry, G1, E1 is less than or equal to uh, H gamma E2, for instance, for every gamma in SL2 of uh, Z. Now, you look at gamma v2. What can, what can, what are the possible gamma v2? I'll choose some gamma v2. Gamma v2 will look like some alpha e1. Take gamma to be, <coughs> you know, I let me write alpha e1 plus, or maybe a e1 plus b e2. Any gamma e2 is going to be like a e1 plus b e2, and this. H gamma, uh, yeah. When I apply this this matrix to, when I apply uh, H to this, H looks like G1, then H22, etc. So when I apply this, I'm going to get G1, A G1 E1 plus B H22 E2 plus some thing which will come over there. Okay. I, I apply something which is upper triangular, so in fact, this can stay as G1 E1. It will stay as G1 E1, then B H2 E2 plus, uh, so if it is B E2, uh, sorry, A E1, let me just apply it uh, one second. Yeah, G1 E1. Yeah, I am applying it, sorry, when I apply. G1, E1, no, let, let me let me look at just elements like, let me look at uh, lattice points like E1 plus uh, R E2, just look at such lattice points. And up, then I I know that uh, H applied to this is there to H applied to E1. But H applied to E1, I know is uh, G1, E1. Okay. And so this is greater to this. Now I am allowed to vary yeah, R, and how how do I vary R? I am applying the, the matrix which takes E1 to itself, and then some multiple of R. But what is this thing? This, you are going to get here H1, uh, G1, E1 plus H and R E2, <coughs> R uh, H H22. So, you are going to get norm of this is less than, is greater than the norm of G1 E1. And you are allowed to vary R as you please. And then it is easy to see that you will get the required inequality 2 by root 3. It is already achieved for the rest of it and the first, in SL, essentially you are proving the theorem for SL2, that does the job.
So it is an introduction. I am sorry if I have not explained that too well, but it is better that uh, I leave it a little like that so that you think for yourself and finish the proof. Okay, so that tells you that the k a 2 by root 3 uh, n half s l 2 s l n z equals s l n. Now, if I start with a Notice that uh, if you put in GLNR, the quotient will not have finite measure because there is a whole R star cropping up and the, the essentially the quotient will be a product of R star and SLNR by SLN Z and the R measure on R star is infinite so you will not get anything. And uh, notice the Mahler correction also will essentially use the fact that GM in SLNR because we product was 1 was used and the inequality between so it goes. So, it is a criterion for a sequence in SLNR and not for a sequence in GLNR. GLNR for instance, the, the scalar matrices, if you, they go to infinity, the quotient also they will go to infinity because you are passing the quotient only by SL and Z. So, now this enables you to construct lots of discrete groups in various Lie groups. This uh, lots of uh, lattices, this proves that this SLNZ is a lattice is in SLNR and I'm, I am this enables them to construct lattices in lots of groups. So, what happens is this the final theorem which is due to Borel and Harishchandra <coughs> will tell you if G is an algebraic group. over Q such that there does not exist any non-trivial algebraic morphism of G into C star. This is to be thought of as which makes it into an algebraic group. This is what makes it into an algebraic group, C star into algebraic group. There is morphism, no morphism of G into C star defined over Q. Then G R real points. G is subgroup of JLNC. This is by it. by definition. This is G intersection GLNR. Then GR. Then uh, G G is Z, which by definition is G intersection GLNZ. Oh, I should say something. G is a connected algebraic group. It's important. Connected algebraic group which admits no characters. A morphism of G into C star is called a character. So I'm assuming it admits no character defined over Q. Then G Z in G R is a lattice. That is the quotient. The the hard measure when it descends the quotient is finite. Yeah, yeah, because things can get screwed up because you have an automorphism of the, for instance, the torus to take a split torus and an automorphism which uh, commutator, then there is no character on the, take a symmetric product of a finite group with a torus such that the commutator covers the entire torus. Then there, there, there will be no character, but it is a split torus and you cannot expect the quotient to have 
finite measure. The intersection GLNR is a lattice, is their finite statement. Further, GR by GZ is compact if and only if GQ contains no non trivial unipotent elements. Unipotent means all eigenvalues are 1. So, 1 of course is unipotent element because all eigenvalues are 1, but for the standard unipotent element will be a conjugate of the upper triangular matrix with 1 on the diagonal. That is what one, once you know all the eigenvalues are 1, you can first find an eigenvector which will be a fixed which will be fixed by that element, pass the quotient, find an eigenvector, etc. So, you will find a triangular matrix with 1 on the diagonal that gives you a conjugation. So, anyway, the theorem says that if it admits no characters, character group which admits no characters, then the, uh, the arithmetic group, which you, any arithmetic group, because any arithmetic group is commensurable with GO, is a lattice. That is what the theorem says. Now, <coughs> <laughs> Let me, the condition is essential for the following reason. Take, if you take G to be diagonal matrices in SL2, simplest case, this is uh, SL2C, this means the group is set of There is no integral matrices here because if z is integral, z inverse will fail to be integral. I mean, I, over q is what I am taking. So, if z is an integer, z inverse is not going to be an integer unless it is plus minus 1. And then the subgroup is simply plus minus 1. If you pass the quotient by plus minus 1, you get again c star, I mean r star. I am looking at uh, this is the group, and this is uh, let us call this t. tr is clearly. R cross definition, whereas T Z the quotient is not going to have finite measure. So that illustrates that the condition is necessary. The condition I put down that there are no characters on that. And the question he asked, for instance, take the semi-direct product of T with Z2. T is a normal subgroup and this operates tau not equal to 1 z2 acts taking g to g inverse. Then the commutator subgroup will consist all squares will figure the commutator subgroup. When you conjugate, you are going to shift z inverse to that a b a inverse b inverse will become z square. T you take this tau and take conjugate with that it will become z square, which means the commutator subgroup contains all the squares inside T, therefore all of it because every element is a square anyway, complex numbers. So, the commutator subgroup is the whole thing. In the, in place, if we take a char character chi, oh, uh, I should have been a little more careful. Yeah, this is a, and here, oh well, I sh well, the there is a character here, there is a non-trivial character, but it is a finite order. I mean any character will be become trivial on this and on the quotient you get uh, something which goes to 1. Well, uh, one should uh, do a little, what should one, what I should do is the following. Take diagonal matrices in number of variables and then you take the group A n which permutes these things and then form the symmetric product. A n is its own commutator for n greater than equal to 5 or whatever. And then you find that this group has no characters because when you take commutator, the entire diagonal will be captured. And then on A n itself, there are no, there is no homomorphism to abelian group. A n is its own commutator. 
So, A n times this, there are no characters at all, and therefore, no characters defined over. But here again, the integral points, here there are no integral points, essentially, plus minus ones will be the integral points. So, quotient <coughs> cannot have finite measure, that is the kind of thing. So, it is a the condition put down here is absolutely necessary, there is no. The connectedness is, I mean, this is the less state, the connectedness is kind of a necessary situation. Okay. Now, well, this is a somewhat difficult theorem to prove. At, uh, maybe I will do one thing. At this point, I will assume the theorem and go on because I will come back to this theorem at some point and prove it because it requires a lot more background material about algebraic groups and so on. But I will make a number of uh, comments about it. <coughs> yeah, the first uh, related to this theorem, you know, I I define an arithmetic group for any number field, not just over Q. This statement is only about arithmetic groups for Q. But in general, what happens is this. So, G algebraic group over a number field. K. If we take a number field K, you can embed it in complex numbers. I can do, and it is not, there is no unique, uh, there are several possibilities. For example, if you take uh, if K over Q, Suppose the Galois extension, you can apply an automorphism of Galois automorphism of K, and then you get a new embedding in C. There are several possible embeddings in C. Okay. And these embeddings, in fact, you can say it like this: you look at K tensor C over Q. This is a finite dimensional algebra, and it will break up into product of C n copies, where n is the degree of the extension. K tensor C will break. And look, look at inside here, look at K tensor R. This will break into certain number of copies of R and certain number of copies of C. I mean, the copies of R will depend. Sometimes when you embed K in C, it will go into a real field. Sometimes it may not go into a real field. It has to so, there are real embeddings and complex embeddings. So, what happens when you take K tensor R? This will be correspond to the real embeddings and this will correspond to complex embeddings. That, that is the way it works. In any case, so you can look at G is an algebraic group over K, and you can talk of for every embedding, every distinct embedding of K as a dense subfield. Of R or C, get an inclusion of GK in R or C correspondingly, and therefore you get a diagonal inclusion of GK in the product GR some number of factors cross some number of factors GC. This and inside here you have this GO. This becomes a discrete subgroup of this. If you take one embedding GO may not be a discrete subgroup of the corresponding G R or G C may be, but if you put together all the embeddings, then you are in good shape. <coughs> Here I must say that uh, you have to treat two embeddings uh, in complex numbers of K as the same if they differ by complex conjugation. Only by complex conjugation, then you treat the two embeddings as the same. That is basically the induced modulus is the same. 
whatever embedding. But for, for real embeddings, the two embeddings are distinct. The modulus will the modulus will be different coming from the two embeddings. The modulus will be different. But for complex embeddings, it can be the same if it's a conjugate. So if it's a conjugate, take just one. Otherwise, you take the standard notation is if it has they say R1 real embeddings and R2 complex embeddings, the two R2 complex embeddings, then you take R1 plus R, R1 factors here and R2 factors there. Okay, now here it becomes discrete subgroup. Why does it become discrete subgroup? The point is you look at K tensor R. See, when you look at K tensor R, K is embedded into this and O is inside here. O, this is a look. I mean, uh, it's a tensor, tensor product with R, so it's some R and some of the some of the factors may be C, some of the factors may be R. But you can th th think of it as R, if you like, it's uh, R one plus two, R two. That's what it's going to look like. When you tensor with R, you're going to get this. The factors which give you C give you twice the dimension in R, and this is the kind of you can identify K tensor R with R by R one plus R two. And what does O it go into? It, I say I claim it goes into a discrete group, the discrete subset. Why? For, for example, let me put it like let me put take something like Q root two. Root two, Q root two has two embeddings in R, one which takes root two to the positive square root, the other to the negative square root. In R cross R, in the diagonal embedding, everything becomes discrete because the elements are going to look like, you know, it's it's. Uh, It'll, in one, if it goes to a plus b root two, the other it goes to a minus b root two. So if a, if uh, if you have a sequence, a n plus b root two n going to infinity, you look at a minus root. I mean, if it if it converges, look at the a minus one. That cannot converge because if both converge, then you get a sequence of integers converging and a sequence of square root uh, square root two times integers converging. So this, I mean, the essentially is the same argument for a number field when you have integers in the number field. The same thing works. Okay, so this becomes a GO becomes a discrete subgroup of GC. Now there is a construction which uh, treats this product group uh, rather. Uh, so you can think of this, if you like, as G of K tensor R. You know, <coughs> after all. How would I say this? <laughs> one can uh, one can talk of G. I, I talked of G with integral values after all. So in general, one can talk of G with values in any algebra over K. Basically, what does it mean? You take matrix. See, it's a subgroup of GL, GL and C. So take GLN of K tensor R, and there take matrices which satisfy the polynomials that you want. That's the way it's going to work. Okay. I should take K tensor Q over C for that. Then it becomes, uh, then it really, then it re, if you take, so if you think of that, but GL of K tensor C, if you like, is uh, GL of some matrix algebra, which you can think of as contained in some big, bigger GLN and so on, and then it becomes an algebra group defined over Q. And then what you are looking at is integral points over Q. And so, to handle these things also, the same theorem can be used. What happens is this: you can replace over k, and that means no morphism of G into k star defined over k. Then, G O equal to G intersection G L and O uh, is a lattice. In here, it should be G K tensor R. Becomes a lattice there. The same statement goes over, we're back up. And that kind of construction is necessary. I'll uh, presently tell you why. And there's also this criterion for when the quotient is compact. Let me illustrate that with an example where, in fact, one can give a pleasant proof. Sorry? Yeah, I, I want G to be connected, yes. 
see the, the, the r valued points may not be connected i don't care but g the c valued points must be connected that's so when i when i take k tends when it is defined over k I, uh, in fact it turns out if the c valued points in one embedding is con connected one embedding of k is connected then in every other embedding also it will aut <coughs> automatically connected those are technical points which <coughs> but let me the second statement that when gr by gz is compact if and only if gq contains no non trivial unipot elements let me illustrate that one situation which it works the following suppose f is a quadratic form over q such that over r it is equivalent to uh, or q in say n variables n greater than equal to 3 such that <coughs> Such that over R, it is uh, equivalent to the form x1 square plus x2 square plus xn square, xn minus 1 square minus xn square, the Lorentz group, Lorentz quadratic form with one negative eigenvalue and the rest positive. Suppose <coughs> over R it's and has no non trivial 0 over q that is f of x1 x2 xn is not equal to 0 if x1 xn is in qn minus 0 any non zero vector the quadratic form takes value It is not difficult to find such quadratic forms in three variables. Some elementary number theory will tell you I think something like this x1 square plus x2 square minus 3x3 square. The point is you have to find uh, some integer which is not sum of two squares. Then if you do this, this will not represent 0. This, is, this will never be 0 on a non-zero rational vector. But over reals, it is clearly Lorentz group. I mean, I can ch change the variable to root 3 fx3, be done with it. So, such a quadratic form you can find in th 3 and 4 variables you can manage. Actually, beyond 4, you cannot do it. If the number of variables get there to 5, any quadratic form which, uh, <coughs> which any, any indefinite quadratic form in more than 5 variables over rationals has a 0, non zero, non trivial 0, it is called the Hasse. Minkowski theorem. There is such thing. So, anyway, for two, we can do things for 3 and 4. What happens is this if this happens, then you look at SOF R, which is the so called Lorentz group SO n minus 1, 1 real points. It is the thing which leaves in the quadratic form sigma xi square i less than 10 minus 1 minus x n square that is the group s y n minus 1 1. If you take this group then s y f r modulo s y f z is compact. How does one prove such a statement? You see what happens is this you look at SYFR, it is sitting inside SLNR. Firstly, the first claim is you look at the mapping, let me again use SLN, use the term, I mean use the notation SLNZ to be gamma. I am going to look at SYFR intersection 
I'm going to look at this map, SYFR by SYFZ. There's a nice little map of this into SLNR by SLNZ. The first point is that the image is a closed subset. We'll come to that. So, one, the image is closed. Two, the image is relatively compact. For the second one, I am going to apply the Mahler criterion. Notice that the whole of SOFR is sitting inside SLN R and so I can apply the Mahler criterion. To say it is relatively compact is to say that you cannot, you cannot have a sequence in SYFR which goes to infinity modulo SLNC. That is the kind of thing I want to make sure. <coughs> Why is that? The point is, let us let me first put a second statement image is relatively compact. So, I have to show that if I have a sequence, any sequence GN, no sequence GN can go to infinity modulo. SLNZ. Suppose GN goes to infinity modulo by the Mahler criterion, we know there exists lattice points alpha n in ZN minus 0 such that GN alpha n goes to 0. Now, look at the value of the quadratic form f on gn alpha n. gn preserves the quadratic form. I am sorry, once again it is uh, notation is bad. I have used m there. So, let me put m in gn minus 0, gm alpha m. Now, f by definition gm is the orthogonal group which means it preserves the quadratic form. This, so, therefore, this is f of alpha m f is a quadratic form which is over q. So, it is some it is of the form a j x i x j there is some bounded denominators and therefore, this value is always some you see this value is first of all it is not 0 and it is also in some uh, 1 over n times integers all the time. But our quadratic form does not represent 0. So, the ultimately you know because, because this f and g this goes to by g n alpha m goes to 0. So, this goes to 0 and therefore, this goes this limit goes to 0, but on the other hand it is always 1 over n z and not 0 a contradiction. Okay. So, it proves that this is relatively compact and for the first statement the idea is this you look at the mapping what is the quadratic what is the you have this group SLNR acting on symmetric matrices as follows. You have SLNR acting on acts on symmetric n plus n matrices. Any symmetric n plus n matrix corresponds to some quadratic form and the action is like this take T on matrix symmetric matrix is transpose T S T. Symmetric bilinear forms and quadratic forms and bijective correspondence and this is the way symmetric bilinear forms transform under transmissions. Okay. And our quadratic form is defined over Q. So, this our uh, see T S choose take S to be the symmetric matrix corresponding to the given quadratic form corresponding to f. So, then our look at SLNR it operates I am looking at the mapping from SLNR into symmetric matrices. namely t goes to transpose t 
yes t. Now, if t was in the orthogonal group, then transpose t as t is s itself. So, this means we get this map factors through s l n r by s y f. And if you look at a integral matrix in this, so if so s l n r factors through this, so if t is integral, transpose t as t is also integral. So, what happens is this under this map, so you have this map, uh, uh, this is in symmetric inside symmetric matrices. So, you have this map from S L N R to symmetric matrices and inside this factors through S L N R by S Y F and then you look at S L N Z sitting inside. This will go into integral symmetric matrices or at least everything which is uh, at most multiple by some fixed for, uh, rational number. So, it goes into a discrete set. In other words, SL and Z times SYF will go into a discrete set. Its inverse image is precisely SL and Z by SYF. SL and Z times SYF is a closed subset. So, and by definition of uh, top, the topology on the quotient, the image of SL and Z by SYF in SL and R by SL and Z is closed. By definition, the closed the topology on the quotient. So, if you have found that the set is closed, the set is relatively compact, therefore, it is compact. So, the quotient space here is compact. Actually, there is a slight uh, little more argument you have to give here. What one proves is that the image is uh, co compact, image is closed, therefore, compact. Still, you have to prove that this is a homeomorphism. This is because it is essentially it comes out of the bare category argument because uh, you know you just have to prove some open set goes into an open set because the homogeneous situation that is the kind of situation. So, you, you can use that argument and be done with it. Anyway, that is uh, so we, this is one I have given this is one way of constructing discrete groups with compact quotients in a space like uh, what I have done is to construct a compact quotient SO21 and SO31. Provided I have a quadratic forms, as I said, in more than five variables, there is no uh, five or more variables. There is no quadratic form with that property. So there, you have to use a different kind of construction. But basically, same kind of idea. What you do is this: you look at Q root two and take a quadratic form on this other form. Say, for instance, look at a quadratic form like this: x one square plus x r square, x n minus one square plus root 2 minus root 2 x n minus 1 square x n square ok. What happens is see the, when I take the real embedding which takes root 2 to the positive square root then I get a Lorentz group. But if I go take it to the negative square root I get here x 1 square plus x square plus root 2 x n square which is standard quadratic form and the corresponding group is compact. So, what you will find is that the if you look, look at the integers here this is this is f for us s y f of integers in q root 2 it will embed diagonally in a Lorentz group cross a compact group and inside there the same argument will work to tell you that the quotient is compact. Now, you can project modulo the compact group and still get a discrete group with compact quotient because that get won't get affected. So, in a Lorentz in any Lorentz group you are able to construct a discrete group with compact quotient. In fact, you know the, the standard uniformization theorem tells you that there are lots of discrete groups in in uh, SL 2 R PSL 2 R with uh, PSL 2 R is same as SO 2 1 there are plenty of them. And in fact, there is an uncountable family because there is an uncountable family of Riemann surfaces. But in higher dimensions, it is not true. There, you cannot find uncountable families. And the only way of constructing discrete groups with compact quotient is to resort to arithmetic and arithmetic groups. 
uh, in fact, uh, in again in uh, SO31 and SO21, you, you can, there are other methods of constructing, but even there, you, there is no continuous family. So, it becomes much more difficult to construct them geometrically. However, arithmetic is the way out. Arithmetic gives you constructions, plenty, plenty of them. You know, in fact, I said the root 2 here, I could have put root 3 here, you know, any number of possibilities are there. So, you go get whole families of uh, discrete groups. And it is because it was very difficult to find the discrete groups with compact quotients that people started wondering whether arithmetic is the only way to find them. And the eventual theorem that <coughs> Margulis proved is yes, it is true. <coughs> there, are <coughs> there is a family of excep exceptional algebraic groups. If you leave them out, the rest of the algebraic groups, the only way is via arithmetic. That is Margulis theorem, which is the ultimate aim of this series of lectures. <coughs> I think I will stop here. <coughs> <coughs> As I said, uh, I will have to wait and see. I will try and see if I can devise a proof of the Borel Hexana theorem, which is uh, easier than what I have in mind now. If I succeed, I will give you the proof early, but otherwise, I will postpone it to a distant date. We will see. <laughs>